This is Pat Salber with The Dr. Weighs In, and we're going to talk about something we haven't talked about before, and that's alcohol. Um, not a little sip of wine, but people who actually have an alcohol abuse disorder. And I have with me today John Mendelson, who's a doctor, actually trained, both trained at UCSF, and he has a new company, and I jokingly said it, it's DXRX. I said, oh, is it DXRX or Dixrix? <laughs> it's, it's DXRX. We're not doing urology. <laughs> so, so as a, And yes, we both trained at UCSF, and they just got rid of the leeches. They're They've moved on to more modern techniques since we've been there. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. I did take care of somebody who was getting their wound cleaned out with leeches. Exactly. So um, I thought if you could just tell us a little bit, um, we haven't, we do write about addiction, but we haven't specifically written much about alcohol. Um, how big a problem is this? Is it a really big problem? Is it just a hidden problem? Tell us about it. Well, alcohol, alcohol and alcohol use disorder and excessive drinking are the biggest drug problem in the world. It's the biggest drug problem in the world. It's, estimated, it's bigger than opioids? Uh, maybe 100 times bigger than opioids. Uh, it's estimated that about 1 in 10 people have a bad relationship with alcohol. And that means that they drink more than they should. They, they, they're unable to control their intake. They're unable to stop when they want. And they do things they don't want while drinking. And they have harm from their drinking. Um, of those, of those one in ten people, uh, uh, only at, it, it's a progressive problem. So people start in their thirties, and then they really get going. And it, you know, they they, they get they, they get they get heavy drinking in their thirties, and they progress on in their forties to having you know, measurable problems with their families, with their work, with legal issues. Uh, virtually, you could say everyone who's had a DUI has a drinking problem, and and in the United States and the rest of the world, those problems are largely unaddressed. And why do you think that is? Um, are the treatments just not that good? Uh, it's a it's a complicated reason why alcohol hasn't been addressed much in the United States. First, there's a stigma of having a alcohol problem. Second, there there uh, the recovery community has insisted that abstinence is the only outcome that's meaningful. And there's a lot of data that says that's not the case for people. For example, people who go into abstinence based treatment programs at five years, eighty percent of them are drinking, but drinking less. So it's a problem that can get better and, 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 and people change on, but absence isn't the only pathway. And don't you think in a way, I, I find it interesting because I have had a, a friend who was abstinent for a long time and really felt kind of the absence of the com camaraderie of not, you know, going to the bar and getting, you know, really drunk, but just being able to sit around and have a glass of wine with somebody. So is this a, is this a big selling point now to say, you don't have to be absent and we still can offer you some hope? Yes, I, th I think it really is. I think actually it's a, it, and, and what's nice is that, that for the last 30 years, the National Institute of Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse and other academic researchers have been, have been searching and finding treatments that allow people to control their alcohol use. So we have lots of studies out there showing that medications can decrease days of heavy drinking in people seeking treatment or decrease heavy drinking days. In other words, they can decrease the number of days per week you drink or decrease how much you drink on a particular day. And we so tell us about this. And as you do, tell us about the medication treatment. And as you do, weave in for us the unique approach that your new company is taking. Yes, absolutely. So so, so the medications, so when, when people drink, you think about it, almost everyone stops drinking, right? You know, when you, when you drink, when you go out with your friends to have wine, you have, you have some wine or some beer or some alcohol, and you stop at some point. And what, what's that point? That point's a point where you're happy, you're intoxicated, but you're not yet having any bad adverse reactions. You're not having, you're not slurring your words, you're not stumbling, you don't feel bad, you don't feel out of control, right? So that set point, that point of like of, of between how much you take and when you stop is, is actually, that's biologically determined and it's amenable to medication. And what the medications appear to do is they decrease the amount of pleasure you're getting from the drink. They don't decrease it severely. You can still have enjoyment, right? But they decrease it enough so that the, the signals to stop emerge sooner. And I think everybody knows that in the past there was um, a drug that, 
when you took it, it used to make you really sick. And, yes. and people, it wasn't very popular. Not very many people used it. It was called antabuse. Yeah, and, and antabu antabuse is still around. We, we don't use that in our service because it, that, it's a, it, the kind of training it gives people is just aversive, just, just unpleasant. And that kind of training doesn't work better than, than actually getting positive rewards. So negative rewards never work as well as positive rewards. And antabuse is nothing but a negative reward system. So what are you using? And how are you um, monitoring that what you're doing is, is better than, for example, getting a medication in a clinic. So, so we're using now Trexone as our primary drug, our first choice drug. It's approved by the FDA with an indication of decreasing alcohol use in, in people who want to control their drinking. And uh, it works by blocking what are called opiate receptors. It turns out that when you drink, some of the pleasure is, is caused by release of opiates in the brain. And if you block that part of the pleasure, you don't drink as much. Right. And so and and many, many good studies have shown dramatic reductions in alcohol use with naltrexone. What our approach is, the studies that were conducted were conducted largely in end stage alcoholics. So if you look at people earlier in their drinking history, before they've gone downhill, before they've really made a mess of their lives and you apply the medication in that population, you get even a better response. It's a little like, you know, when we take people who have high blood pressure, you know, if you wait till they have end stage high blood pressure and they've already got kidney damage and they've had a stroke, you don't get as good a response as you start when their blood pressures are, are, are just above normal. So why should somebody go to your program to get naltrexone? Why not just go to your uh, primary care doctor and ask for it? Well, well, one of the interesting things, because what we do something really special too. So one of the, so now Trexone's been around a long time and some primary care doctors have tried it. The problem is, unless you know exactly how much you're drinking, you don't know if you're drinking less, more, or the same. And the, the drug doesn't work in absolutely everybody. So, so, so we monitor people's drinking using a, a breathalyzers that are paired to smartphones. And we have people breathalyze twice a day in the morning when they wake up and in the evening just before they go to bed. And therefore, we can quantify their alcohol intake. We can actually quantify how much alcohol they're taking in. And we get, if you sign up with our program, we, you get the breathalyzer. We have you breathalyze two or three days, get some baseline data. Then we add the medication and see how well you're doing. So we get objective proof that you're improving. So the other interesting thing about people with alcohol use disorder and alcohol problems is denial, right? And, you know, like it's real. So people say, oh, you know, like I've got a party tonight. I'm not going to take my medication, right? And then they don't take it that night. And they say, oh, next night I'm not going to take my medication either. So we actually make sure you're taking your medication. How do you do that? Um, we have you know, adherence is really the major problem in all of uh, health care. Well, well, we send Guido by, and if you don't take your medication, he has a little conversation with you. That's actually not... not, <laughs> not, not not, not true. Not true. We don't, you know, we don't want to pick on Guido here. We have like other people too, but no, but actually seriously, we have you photograph your pill in the hand just before you take it. And we get, we get a pill photo. We've done for many years, my lab, we uh, pioneered this method of, uh, of uh, automating this particular technology to, to measure adherence uh, to medications. And it does work. People will take pill photos and they pill photos are directly related to whether they take the pill, the pills or not. And uh, so we monitor your adherence. If we start seeing that your adherence is trailing off or that your that your alcohol levels are going up, that's when we would make it a, a change. That's when we would contact you and make some changes. That's when you send Guido in. And then we send Guido in, exactly. <laughs> and and it, what he does, he brings a different medication because it turns out there are six medications that have got adequate phase two evidence uh, showing decreased days of heavy drinking or decreased heavy drinking days in the medical literature. It's actually stunning that we have that many medications working by different mechanisms of action available today. And the uptake amongst primary care physicians and others is less than 1%. The uptake even in, in people who do residential rehab care is surprisingly low as well. And you might wonder why that is. Again, those programs are largely divorced from the medical universe. They often, if they have a medical director, the doctor is, doesn't actively participate in the treatment planning, is there just to make sure people aren't sick, and, you know, aren't having acute alcohol withdrawal. So, and, and, and many of these programs do not institute post, post, you know, aftercare medication management when they absolutely should be. So let me ask you a couple of uh, quick questions here. One is, um, if somebody comes to your program and has success, do they have to stay in the program forever? 
well, right, well, right now we're, we're we're inexpensive enough, so people could stay forever at a hundred dollars a month. I mean, how, you know, like well, that's less than most people are spending on alcohol every month. But um, the answer is we're we're looking for six months of continuous treatment, and that number comes from the literature. The FDA feels that's that's a at least with medication trials, uh, six month of change is is, is represents an, an adequate change to to say that's going to go to the future. Okay, and uh, two last questions. One of them I think is very important, which is, do you have any results from any patients who have gone through your programs yet? And if so, briefly, what are they? And are they published, or or, or is it just you're collecting the data? So so far, we're, so far, we're not running any uh, any IRB sanctioned clinical trials. So we have, but we do have data from our, you know, our first cohort of patients who've gotten through 30 days with us. And, and we're a brand new service. We literally just started like basically January 1 offering this service to people. Uh, and it, it's a telemedicine service. So people come, we meet them where they are. You know, we go talk to them on the telephone. They breathalyze, the breathalyzer results come to our dashboards automatically. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and the medications they pick up at a local pharmacy. In our first cohort of patients, we're showing about a 60% reduction in alcohol use from baseline data. 60%. So that's pretty damn good. Um, and what's also kind of amazing is that we have very dense data. We actually have breathalyzer data on this cohort of people, which no one else has ever seen. My, my colleagues in alcohol research, the way they measure alcohol intake is doing something called timeline follow-back. They basically sit you down with a calendar and say, what did you drink this day? What did you drink that day? It, it, it's it, like a food diary. It's, it's, it's like a food, and, and it's every bit as inaccurate, <laughs> right? So, 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 so we have objective data showing suppression of alcohol intake at 30 days of about 60%. Um, many of our patients, so we, the other thing we give them a choice of is do they want to control their drinking? Do they want to get to a point where they can be social drinkers again? And we're defining that as consistent BACs below blood alcohol concentrates below 0.08, or do they want abstinence? So some patients do choose abstinence, and the ones who've wanted abstinence have gotten there. And uh, the ones who uh, want controlled drinking are showing, again, pretty good responses. Some patients don't show a good response either because they're either because, you know, I, I would actually say probably because we have them on the wrong medication. Um, and a few because they really weren't that motivated to, to do it to begin with. Or they, and, and there are some people who have much more severe disease and they need to go to residential care, right? So uh, I think the final point I would make in all this is that, you know, say, well, what about AA, right? What about, why not just go to AA? We're, we're, we, we, we're big supporters of AA. We think you should go to AA. If it works for you, go. But we think that we offer something on top of AA that's actually really very useful, which is, again, suppression of alcohol intake. So that, so that you end up with, 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 the, with the ability to make the choice to go to AA, to seek abstinence, or to just get your life back together and, and keep moving forward while drinking in a controlled fashion. Well, it sounds like you're offering a lot of hope to people who struggle with um, alcohol addiction and uh, interesting approach. I look forward to seeing some clinical studies so you could get a 60% yeah. in a peer-reviewed uh, literature, which would be really good. So for everybody, $100 a month. And how do they reach you if uh, somebody's interested in enrolling in your program? Well, they find that Dick's Ricks. They, 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 find, they go to dxrxmedical.com, dxrxmedical.com. And uh, they'll find us. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much. Very interesting yeah. and very important work. Thank yeah. you, John. Yeah, and thank you for having us. A lot of great conversation. Let's do it again. Okay, right. we will.